you have your Bibles, I want to invite you. We're going to find ourselves in uh, the book of Mark. We're walking through Mark this year. Actually, to be honest, uh, through next year. We'll be finished in March, probably. Uh, we find ourselves in Mark chapter 8 this morning, and we've been walking through that. And last week, you heard a phenomenal sermon from Pastor Gene on the importance of guarding our life and protecting our life and not allowing the unleavened things of life to come in. Uh, and, and effect, uh, the, the, the leaven, little leaven effects. And he did a beautiful job on illustrating that. So we're so thankful for him. Uh, if many of you wondered, I was not here last week. I was preaching a revival in Louisiana, and uh, it was beautiful. Thank you for allowing me to go. And the last night of revival, they had a, a, a Catholic family down there, and it was a mother and a father and two teenage sons. And they had been there both services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. And on uh, Wednesday night, they all four gave their life to Christ and were baptized that night. And so uh, it was pretty remarkable to see. Because the pastor came up to me before. He says, hey, listen, I can't tell you why, but I'm going to fill the baptistry. Is that okay? I said, man, let's roll. We do this. And so thank you for allowing uh, me to do that. Thank you for being here this morning. We don't take it lightly that you're here. I know you gotta, could have been a million other places, but you're here in God's house. God has brought you here uh, for a blessing. He's brought you here to encounter Christ, to experience what God has. He's brought you here to know you are not alone and to know you are loved and that God loves you. And there's people beside you that want to see you grow and want to see you be blessed in Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for being here. So we're in Mark chapter 8. Specifically looking at verses 22 through 26. And here's our big idea for the day. If we want to take something and put it in our back pockets, it would be this. Now listen close. Jesus may not meet our expectations, but he will always exceed expectations. Jesus may not meet your expectations, but he will always exceed expectations. Have you ever had expectations and had, had them fall flat? You get them real high, and you expect something. And, and, and usually our expectations come from a past experience that we it kind of leads into. Or sometimes, honestly, uh, I, and what I, I love doing premarital counseling because I love talking to the newlyweds. And I love, for the first time, it seems like they've never had the conversation of what they each expect in the marriage. It's great to watch eyes open and jaws aghast, right? It's really fun. Because reality is going to set in in just a little while, right? This was brought to my attention, as far as expectations, a thing that stands out to me. Back in 2016, in, um, in Livingston Parish, where I used to live, and Pastor Hayden used to live, this parish is down there, this county's up here, uh, 90 to 95 percent of the parish was flooded. And so just imagine 90 percent of Jefferson County underwater, right? And so that's what we were doing. That's how it was. And, and as, as the rain was coming and everything was going, before they made an official, like, this thing was going to happen, I went to our church because I, I, I figured we would be needed for an evacuation point. So I called our director of missions. I said, hey, man, look, I'm, I'm ready to go. Tell me what you need and all this. He goes, I, we're not going to need anything. It's not going to be that bad. And we got a couple other churches. I said, are you sure? I said, I've been flooded out a couple times. I feel, I feel like this is going to be a big one. He goes, no, no, you're not needed. We don't need you at all. I promise it's okay. I said, okay. 90 minutes later, he calls. He said, we have a bus of 200 people coming to your church in an hour. I was like, well, I'm glad for the notice, right? And so I rushed to the grocery store, and I loaded up the grocery cart full of pasta and grits and oatmeal. Because that you, pasta and grits oatmeal go a long way. It, right, it, it makes the empty stomach feel full. You understand? And so, it, but, and so I get there. When I get back to the church, there's the Army National Guard unloading 200 people off of buses into our church. Now, why, were, why was I in such a, a hectic? Because the whole time I'm riding back and forth, I'm calling people. Hey, I need your church. Hey, I need your church. Is your house flooded? Good. No? All right, come here. Right? It's one of those situations. Well, how do we get into that? Well, because of, of faulty expectations. I expected one thing, and this guy expected a different thing. And so when it happened, guess what? There was a, a bunch of stuff that needed to be fixed. What is it like in our spiritual life? God, think about this. You ever thought about this? God has expectations for how your life should be. So much so that he wrote them down and put them in a book so that you can know what those expectations are. Every one of us, right? We we know God has expectations. 
you have expectations for your life, don't you? You have expectations for your marriage, for your retirement, for your singleness, for your education, for your job. You have expectations. Most of us build our life around achieving these expectations and goals. But we do so in a way for whatever reason, if we're going to be honest this morning, we do so as we set these expectations and goals for our lives. We usually leave out whether intentionally or unintentionally, we usually leave out growing in Christ's likeness as a goal, as an expectation. Why do you think that is? Why do we leave out the one thing that has an eternal, lasting impact on us? Why do we leave that out of our expectations of ourselves, of our lives, of our service, of our Christianity? Why do we do that? In this passage this morning, we're going to see how Jesus comes and he not only meets expectations, but he exceeds expectations. What I want you to see as we walk through this this morning is that God not only has expectations for your life, but he's going to give you every tool needed to fulfill those expectations in glory in Christ Jesus. So let's look at our text this morning. Starting in verse 22 of chapter 8. And they, that's Jesus and his disciples, came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter into the village. Father God, would you fill us with your spirit now? Fill me with your spirit. God, would you hide me behind your cross that I would make Jesus plain today. That your text would be uh, a balm to a wounded heart that it would be a refreshing spring welling up inside of a dry soul. That it would be a bread of life inside a hungry body. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing I want you to see comes out of verse 22, and it's this, that we should have an expectation of Jesus working in our lives. We should have an expectation of Jesus working in our lives. Look at verse 22. These guys, they hear his friends, hear about what's going on. They know Jesus has been in the area working. He left and he's come back. And they hear him. He's a miracle worker. He's a teacher. They don't understand all of what he is, but they know a few things. They know that sick people, broken people, demon-possessed people, when they are brought to Jesus, Jesus heals them. He takes their vices away. He heals their heart, their body, and their soul. So they have expectations. So what do they do? They, what do they do with this expectation? They don't just let it lie dormant, right? They do something about it. They, they understand that there's healing over there. There's a miracle over there. There's salvation over there. That Jesus has come. He can break my vices. He can restore my life. What do they do about it? They said, we have this friend. He's broken. He's outcast. He's blind. He's not allowed to go to church. He's not allowed to worship with people. He's viewed as if he has sinned or his mom and daddy has sinned. So, so so he is really an outcast in society except for this real tight-knit of friends. Thank goodness for tight-knit friends. Amen? So what do they do? They hear Jesus is in the area and they bring the man to Jesus. Now notice, they don't bring him to Jesus wondering what Jesus is going to do. They bring him to Jesus with a full expectation that when their friend encounters Jesus, his life is going to change. Now hear that, because I think we need, to, we need to sit here for a moment. There's some of you in this room that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm not throwing stones. Please don't misunderstand. And you don't have a relationship with Jesus because maybe you're thinking to yourself that I'm too far gone. I'm too broken. My family history won't allow for it. 
I got too much going on. I got too many problems in my life. It's too shattered. There's, too, there's so many pieces that Jesus can't find all the pieces to put back together. You may be thinking that. I mean, like this man's friends, I want to tell you, when you come to Jesus, beloved, he makes you whole. And the beautiful thing about Christ is when you come to Jesus, there's not a part of you that he does not begin to heal. Now, for some of us, and, and, and you, you know this to be true, sometimes that healing is some deep trauma that you've endured out throughout your life. Some deep childhood trauma, maybe. Maybe some stuff you did or had done to you when you were a teenager or a kid that you are absolutely ashamed of. Maybe some stuff that you did or had done to you in your 20s and 30s that you would never tell even a counselor you're so bothered by it. And you, and you wonder, could Jesus heal me? Absolutely. Is it immediate? More often times than not with that type of trauma and hurt. But I've seen people walk with Christ in year after year. Sometimes it's 20 years. Sometimes it's 25 years. But I've seen Jesus completely heal from past wounds. And it be a whole new person on this end of the hurt. And it is glorious and beautiful to see. Jesus comes to heal. Unlike the enemy, unlike Satan, who the Bible tells us he wants to kill and destroy, Jesus has the healing power for our entire lives, our souls. They expected Jesus to work in their friend's life. Do you expect Jesus to work in your life? Do you actually expect Jesus to work? So oftentimes, many of us, and I, I, I wouldn't want to ask us to raise our hands, how many of us this morning, I just, through good-naturedness, through good intentions, just got up, got dressed, and came to church, but you did so without any real intentional expectation of encountering Jesus and being changed when you left? See, so when, when we come to Christ, we, we come to encounter the risen King, the risen Savior, the one who's conquered death, hell, and the grave, the one who has your eternity in the palm of his hand. He not only wants to change you in eternity, he wants to change you now into Christ's likeness now. There is never a moment in your life that Jesus is not seeking to move you to look more like him. And he's doing everything he can to make that happen. There's an expectation that things were going to happen. So in the flood of 2016, um, we, like I said, we had 200 people that got flooded out and were at our church. And... Um, I had to leave because I had to go on a rescue mission. And I, was, uh, I had a boat, and I was rescuing people from these houses as their house was, was flooding. And w while I got down there, uh, I had to go down this one, one house, and a, and a motor, a trolling motor, wouldn't fit on the boat. And so you talk about looking like a redneck. I got a John boat in waist deep water, and it's steadily rising. And I got a tow rope tied to the bottom of this boat, and I'm just dragging people in a boat down the road. Well, two of these people in this boat were my cousin and her husband, Kristen and Bryce. They had just lost everything. And I brought them to the church, and they changed. And you know what they started doing immediately? They didn't sit in the corner. They didn't cry a pity party, although they could have and would have been justified. You know what they started doing? They went to the kitchen and started cooking for everybody else. They were getting sleeping bags and, and laying them out for people. They were, they were ministering to the kids that were there. Bryce was taking care of people's dogs and pets as they came in. Why? Because they had an expectation that Jesus had an expectation for them, no matter their situation. See, some of us think that because we're in a season or circumstance in life that Jesus doesn't have an expectation that we are to grow or we are to be disciples who make disciples. That our disciple making our disciple growth is paused because of this specific circumstance. But beloved, that's not how grace works. That's not how the Spirit works. That's not what the Word of God tells us, is it? That there's always an expectation of growth in Christ's likeness. So expect Jesus to work in your life. And, and, and can I encourage you with this? I want you to look at the friends. Look at his friends. Look, some of us have friends, and there are dear friends. But we know that they're stagnated in their growth in Christ, or they're not in Christ. And we would call them far from God friends. And they've been stagnated so long or far from God so long that we don't have an expectation that God's going to work in their life. Can, can I just say, be honest, shame on us. Shame on us. 
Shame on us to live around people that are stagnated in Christ and don't know Christ and not live in the fullness of the expectation that God is going to move in their life. And he wants to use us to do it. You, you know that? That God wants to use you. And it may not be you sharing the gospel with them. It may not be you leading them to Christ. It may not be anything about you specifically coming out of your mouth. But God wants to use your growth in Christ to help them on their faith journey to and in Christ himself. So have an expectation that God's not only going to work in your life, but he's going to work in your friend's life through you. See, God's desire, his expectation for every one of us is to know and grow in Christ Jesus. And we should work towards that expectation even if others doubt us. Could you imagine he's got this group of friends, let's say three, four, or five friends, and, and they're taking this man, they're leading him by the hand through the crowd. You've got to imagine there's some naysayers in the crowd, huh, Jamie? They're saying, oh, what are you doing? Well, we're taking our friend to Jesus. Well, that guy's been blind since birth. Jesus can't heal him. And Jamie, what would you tell them? You say, Jesus healed me. I bet he can heal him, right? But the people, here's, this is the thing. And this is a sad truth. And Christian folks, we are bad at this sometimes. We get our blessing, and we ain't worried about nobody else's blessing. We get our salvation, we're not too worried about other salvation. We get our breakthrough, we're not worried about somebody else's breakthrough in Jesus Christ. And we become stagnant in our own heart. And we lose that expectation. And we become the naysayers that we used to hate. Don't stop moving toward Jesus Christ even if people doubt you. And don't be the doubter that keeps someone from moving towards Jesus Christ. Second thing we see is this. Jesus may work in ways that do not meet our expectations. So a few weeks ago, we saw Jesus do some wet willies in people's this guy's ears to heal him. You remember that? He, and then he spit on his hands and rubbed his tongue. We will not be doing any of that in First Baptist. I can tell you that. That is off the table when it comes to healings. But Jesus does something unique with this guy, doesn't he? Let's look. He takes the blind man by the hand. He brings him out of the village. Again, he gets alone with this man. He's personal with this man. He wants that man to know that he feels his hurt. He feels his pain. That he has his full attention. I want you to know, when you come to Jesus Christ, he has all of you. And you have all of him. Jesus is not going to talk to you. He's not going to be invested in you. He's not going to be healing you. He's not going to be working in your life while he's checking text messages, okay? He's not scrolling through social media. He's not listening for you to stop talking so he can interject. You have his full attention upon you. He brings him out of the village after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him. He asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Well, why didn't Jesus just heal him flat out? Why is he giving him fuzzy vision? It's nighttime vision, right? Listen, if you're riding around at night and things look like trees, you need to surrender to that license not for you anymore. Call the grandkids. Tell them it's their turn to drive. The same. Why does Jesus not heal this man? The same reason with the Syrophoenician woman that he ignores her. He wants this man's faith to grow. See, Jesus may do some things in your life that you think he's working just for halfway healing, but what he's doing, he's giving you, a, if I can, a taste of the healing, a taste of glory, a taste of grace, in order to grow your faith, to, to help you take that next step, if you will, in faith, so that you may grow, you may experience a continued growth in him. He worked to grow the man's faith. He was helping him see Jesus and not just see the miracle, you understand? Look, Jesus works in ways that don't make sense all the time. You ever seen a platypus? What in the world? And you, you may not can explain how Jesus is working in your life. You, you may right now say, God, I don't understand why I'm having to wait so long. I don't understand... I don't understand the brokenness I'm having to experience right now. I don't understand this crisis of my faith right now, Lord. I don't understand how my friend group shattered. I, I don't understand how I'm so uncertain about the next season of my life, God. God, what are you doing? 
And sometimes, I'm going to tell you, God's not going to give you an answer. He's just going to give you a push in the direction that he wants you to go. Jesus works in ways that we don't fully understand. I saw this back to 2016 flood. Uh, we had 200 people there. And listen, in South Louisiana, when it's 95 degree heat and it's about 100 degrees and you have 200 people in a room designed for 100 people, uh, guess what happens with the air in that room? Mmm. Mmm. It gets that get right smell. That's what it, it's. Mmm. So I called up the guy that's in, sh in charge of the shower trailer. I said, hey, man, I need a shower trailer here yesterday. You promised me it was going to be here yesterday. He says, he says it's, it's coming, it's coming. Well, I called him up, and, and he says, it's going to be there today. Well, guess what? It didn't show up that day. I called him the next day. I said, hey, where's the shower trailer? He said, it's coming, it's coming. It's going to be there today. It's what? And you know what I found out? That it didn't come to our church because uh, the larger churches got it and the smaller church didn't. And that's just the reality of the situation. I get it. I understand what it was. I know who I am, who I was. I know where I was at. didn't bother me a bit. But there was a situation. I got 200 people that need to take showers because they are bothering me. It's, it's bad. And I don't have a shower trailer. And what am I going to do? Let me tell you, God orchestrated that shower trailer not coming. Because we had people that realized what was happening. Some of our church members, some people that lived in our community that was not even affiliated with our church, they came to our church and said, hey, our house is not flooded. We have power. Uh, we love to organize a whole thing and get people to start doing rotations in cars over the next week. And for two weeks, we had just rotations every day of people bringing people. To, they're offering up their houses, their bathrooms, their showers, their toilets, all their, their, their tiles, everything to help people that didn't have anything. You, you know what that did for our church? What made them feel? You know what it did for those 200 people? You know what it did for that community to be able to participate in something like that? You know what it did for the glory of God and how it allows us to share the gospel? Way more so than if the shower trailers would have showed up. It never would have happened if the shower trailers showed up. I was so upset at this guy for the shower trailers not showing up that I didn't realize that God was doing something I could not even imagine. Look, you may be genuinely upset at how God is working in your life, and you have every right to be. You can be upset because when we don't have the full picture, we get upset. But you realize God has the full picture. Aren't you glad that Jesus knows the beginning from the end? He knows the beginning from the end. That's a good thing to know that Jesus knows the beginning from the end. That he knows that where you start, you may start, you come to Christ, you're so broken, you may be in Christ, you're so immature, and you're like, and you, you may have, you may be a parent and look at your kids, and you're like, oh my God, will it ever change? Yes, it'll change. Just like you get aggravated at your 16 year old, you know, you may have a 16 year old faith in you, you may be 35. That's okay. That's okay. Jesus is not throwing stones at you because you know what I've learned about Christ? He is much more patient than I give him credit for. Much more patient. He's much more gracious than I give him credit for. You may not be where you want to be. You may not understand all the ins and outs of why you are where you are. But Jesus is working in a way that you don't have to understand. And the beautiful thing is, we don't have to understand. We're not given the right to understand. Because guess what? We are not God. We're not Christ. We didn't make ourselves. We don't organize the universe. We're not saving ourselves. We're not the ones bringing glory in. He is. And Jesus is going to work in many ways to increase your faith, to restore your marriage, to help you grow closer to your children, whether they be in your home or as grown children, to draw you closer to Him. He's going to work in many ways to draw you to a ministry or a servant leadership position in your calling in church and in your faith. He's going to work in many ways to move you away from sin to reward you and bless you, and even to discipline us. So I don't know how or, you know, the means that Jesus is going to use to, to work in your life, but I know the purpose, and the purpose makes all the difference. So we can, we can walk through, and we can have faith through what we don't understand, because we know God's good all the time. And in the South, when somebody says God's good all the time, you say all the time God is good. Just, that's for next time. We'll do it next week. We'll work on it. Third thing I want you to see is this. Verse 25. That Jesus' touch exceeds our expectations and brings much, much more than we deserve. Look at verse 25. 
Then again he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. Ten minutes ago, the man was blind, couldn't see a thing. Now he looks intently, and I love this word intently. Guess when he gets the sight. Now, let me just, just come on, grab a hold of this. When, when God opens his eyes, I want you to hear this. When God opens his eyes, who does he have the fullness? The Bible says intently, so it's a, it's a stare. Parents, you know what that stare looks like, right? It's a, mm, husbands, you know what that stare looks like, <laughs> right? When, when this man opens up his eyes, think of a horse with blinders on. There's no other thing that catches his attention or has his gauge except the face of Jesus. Can I ask you, is that your life right now? Well, that's, a, that's a heavy question, isn't it? Is, is that how you're ordering your marriage right now? That it's only Jesus? Is that how you're arranging your parenting right now? It's only Jesus? Is that how you're, you're, you're working through your retirement years? It's only Jesus? Is that how you're lining up your future as your years of high school and college start and begin? Is it only Jesus? Because this word is a very powerful word because he intently, he saw, he purposefully looked into the face of Jesus. And he began to see everything clearly. The man got more than he deserved and much more than he imagined. And you realize that's what Christ does for you and I? He takes us sinners deserving and worthy of hell and he gives us the fullness of himself. So back in 2016, this flood happens we have people, and it's a lot of crying, as you can imagine. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of stuff going on. And Sunday morning rolls around. It's like 7 o'clock, and, and, and I'm there, and my worship minister's there. And he says, hey, do we want to have church? And I said, do we want to have church? He goes, man, let's have some church. I said, let's have some church. And we got everybody in that sanctuary, and we all packed in. Standing room only, still a pretty good bit of stink in the room, pets everywhere. There's going to be some major carpet cleaning later on, right? And we feel it in that room. These people lost houses, cars, family memorabilia, jobs, everything. Everything. And that old piano started playing. And they started singing how great they are. And then voices started to rise. How great thou art. Feel that place. I could hardly get up and preach. I was crying so hard. You see, when, when Jesus comes, when he comes in your life, in your heart, in your family, in your job, in your marriage, in your relationships, when Jesus comes, he doesn't come to play around. He doesn't come to do the bare minimum for you. He comes to completely and utterly amaze you. And some of us, we've kind of reached a point in our life, in our walk with Christ, those who are in Christ, we've kind of put a pause button on the being amazed, haven't we? Let me ask you, when was the last time you were genuinely amazed by Jesus? When was the last time you actually expected Jesus to do something amazing? He does it every day. What's keeping us from expecting that? You say, I, I, I can't get over this addiction problem I have. I've seen Jesus do amazing things. I don't know if I can restore my marriage. I've seen Jesus do amazing things. I don't know if Jesus can deal with all my personality issues. I've seen Jesus do amazing things. My kid is so far, they're the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter. I've seen Jesus do amazing things. I've seen Jesus 
seen Jesus do amazing things. And the truth is, most of us here have also seen Jesus do amazing things. We just forget about them, don't we? We forget about them. We forget about the amazing things that Jesus does every day. And we go through the mundane and we quit having expectations. We quit setting goals. We quit having objectives. We just go through life. But that's not what God has for you. He desires every day to do a new work within you. And that's for salvation and that's for growth. So I want to give us, if you will, five ways to move towards achieving God's expectations for your life in Christ. Five things. And I think these ain't, these ain't genius things. These are just things I use in my life, I practice in my life, and they work. And I want to share them with you. Number one, set clear goals. Define what you want to achieve by breaking down your expectations into specific achievable goals. Be intentional about your Christ like me. You say, look, I have a pride problem. I want to work on my pride problem. What does that look like for me? I want to talk about myself less. I want to criticize others less. That's a way to work on. That's a specific goal to set. You know, I, I, I want to work on, on, on being more kind. How do, what does it look like to be more kind? I want to say three nice things to somebody today. Right? I want to criticize somebody two less times today. What does it look like to be more Christ-like? I, I want to I, I read through the whole New Testament this year. How do I do that? Well, if I just read one chapter a day, then I can read through the whole New Testament twice this year. I think I can read a chapter a day. It's five minutes a day. These are clear goals to define to moving towards Christ-likeness and seeing Christ move in our life. Number two, develop a plan. Create a detailed plan outlining the steps. Spiritual disciplines are necessarily a part of the plan. Journaling is a part of the plan. Praying is a part of the plan. Reading your Bible is a part of the plan. Make specific time. Say every morning at this time, I'm going to get up. Whether I want to or not, I'm going to be disciplined in getting up. I'm going to spend time in the Word. Maybe, it, and here's the deal, I found for some people, getting up and jumping right into Bible reading is a no-go because you need about a gallon of coffee in you first. And here's the deal, that don't make you less spiritual because you need a gallon of coffee before you read the Bible. Get your coffee in you. Wake up. Get your wits about you. Spend time because you, I, I don't want you to wake up, pray, and go right back to sleep. That didn't do no good. Get your coffee in you. Get your donut if you want it. Maybe a little Danish cream cheese. I don't know what you like. But develop a plan. Make spiritual discipline a part of your plan. Number three, stay committed. Consistency is the key when working towards fulfilling expectations. Listen to this. One day does not give victory, and one day does not give defeat in the life with Christ. Victory comes through a lifetime of small, continual habits. So if you want to grow in Christ, it's small, continual habits, and you will see change. Number four, seek support. Beloved, not a single one of us has ever been told to make this journey on our own. And sometimes we tell ourselves that we are in this journey on our own, and that is a, not a biblical point of view to have. Surround yourself with faithful men and faithful believers, faithful women who can help you and encourage you and join you on the journey. Share your goals with other people so they can help hold you accountable and encourage you along the way. Number five, reflect and adjust. Regularly check your progress. Reflect on whether your goals and methods are still aligned with your expectations. What I've noticed a lot of times in my walk with Christ is I will set up an expectation of where I want to be in, with Christ or want to be doing something for Christ. And halfway there, Jesus will change my passions and desires. But he's, through this process, he's given me a certain set of skill sets to, to, to grow in and develop. And he's changed my desire to now do something else that I never thought I'd be doing for the glory of God. Right? Be willing to adjust as Jesus allows you. But as, as we come to a close this morning, and I hope you write those five things down because they're better beneficial than me. I use them in my life on a daily basis. But as we're thinking about expectations, as our team comes up this morning, are you expecting Christ to work right now in your heart? Are you expecting Christ to work right now in your life? Are you expecting him to work this season in your life? Beloved, God wants to do amazing, 
He wants to do the miraculous. He wants to do the unexpected and the unexplained. He wants to. He desires to. He wants to make you look more like Jesus tomorrow than you are today. And every day after that, He doesn't just meet expectations. He exceeds them. So you may have something you're holding on to today that's holding you back from experiencing and encountering all that Christ has for you. Would you lay that down today? And maybe that's coming to Christ for the first time. Maybe you need to lay down some excuses today as as to why Jesus can't save you and change your life. He can change anybody's life. And He does with joy. Are you moving toward that expectation in your life? Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. I'm going to be out back and Pastor Gene is going to be with me at our next steps booth. If, if you would like to make a decision, whether it's baptism or prayer, maybe it's salvation, we would love to meet with you and pray with you. We pray with people every week. We counsel people every week over there. Don't, don't be shy about coming over there. Maybe as we're singing, you just need to turn to a brother and sister and say, hey, can you pray with me? One of the things I, I, I don't know if we do well enough in the church is realizing that it's not just my blessing to pray with somebody. We all have a blessing to pray with each other. Amen? What expectations do you have for Christ in your life right now? And are you moving towards those? Would you allow God to move in your life today? Would you? Father, thank you so much for the time you've given us today. Thank you for the worship. It was so sweet to my heart and my soul. Thank you for the scripture read today and the prayers given. Thank you for the offering taken. Thank you for your word that was preached, Lord. Thank you for using your servant. Thank you for your spirit moving within us. And God, would you allow us to not leave here today without doing business with you? We've been called to make a decision to Some, it's to lay down sin. Some, it's to take up our cross. For some, it's to make commitments. For some, it's to to leave dead things dead. Jesus, we know you come and you not only meet, but you exceed expectations. Would you do that in our hearts and our midst today? And we ask this in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You're dismissed.